Hi, my friends. It's Dr. Christine Lee here again, but today with a different guest. Today, I have Rich Bontrager with me today, and he is an expert in many different areas, especially the areas of media, presentation, and showing up on camera and showing up on stage. I'm so excited to hear about his life, his career, and also to learn from him myself selfishly, but also to have him share his expert tips with you today. Welcome to the show, Rich. Thanks, Christine. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Could you start us off by just letting us know who you are and your backstory? Yeah, uh, I'm actually celebrating 36 years as a professional broadcaster. Uh, I've been saying 30 years, kind of as a blanket statement. And just this weekend, I went through and I did the math and I'm like, I got a couple more years on me. Uh, <laughs> so I have 36 years as a professional uh, talk show host, broadcaster, sports entertainment. A lot of that uh, is where I come out of. Uh, today, I work with CEOs, executive entrepreneurs to better help them learn these media skills because they're so important now. We live in a media-centric age and people need to know how to shine on camera and shine on stage more than ever before. So I actually coach people and I host a lot of events. Uh, less than an hour ago, I just got off a two-hour live summit that I'm going to do all week long. So I'm always on camera, always on mic, helping people somehow. So how did you become an on-camera person? What was the first glimmer of that kind of idea for you? There wasn't one. Honestly, growing up, I grew up with a horrible stutter. So I didn't read out loud. Uh, I ran out of the classroom crying. I was teased uh, horrendously. So the idea of me ever achieving what I've achieved was only a pipe dream, as people would tell me as a kid. I grew up listening to Cubs baseball out of Chicago with Harry Carey doing Cubs baseball. I'd listen to my transistor radio late at night, and I would eat it up. He could describe the batter, the wind, the sound, the color. The, he, he, you could smell popcorn through the radio with Harry Carey. It, it was unbelievable. And I said, I want to do that. Uh, and then I also love Johnny Carson, late night talk show stuff. And I said, I want to do that. And all the while, I couldn't even introduce myself to a girl. That's how bad my stutter was. Mm -hmm. um, I got there. Uh, my college professor said, you have a great voice, but no one will hire you. You can't do the news. And I found out the ad living, the entertainment, the sports flow was my doorway into doing sports play by play and talk show. And my career took off. So how did the stutter end up not interfering with the performance uh, live or when you're ad living? So this one, the first thing that I teach a lot of the people as I coach them is you have so much in your mind that you want to say. We're always excited. We're always amped up. And we want to share this wealth of information. The problem for many of us is our mouth speed and our brain speed are not the same. I literally had to figure out what would that rhythm, what was that speed rate, and how would I be able to sync those two up? When I was a child, they tried to put me in the special ed classes. They thought I was limited in my own capacity. Instead, my dad kept saying, you don't understand. He's one of the smartest kids you're ever going to meet. He just can't get it out of his mouth. And I literally grew up, never any formal coaching, never classes. I finally figured out what that rhythm was. And once I was able to lock that in, um, it unlocked a whole new doorway of a living and a career. I imagine. So what was that what did you have to tell yourself? How, what, what, was, what were the ins and outs of doing that? So slow down was number one. Um, slow down because I was trying to fire hose people with so much stuff um, because I, I wasn't normally the conversational guy at the table. So when people finally did say, hey, Rich, what do you think? Rich would want to shout it out all at once. <laughs> and I'd get tongue-tied, I would stutter, and then Rich would go be quiet again because Rich blew it. And once I figured out, Take a deep breath, figure out what you're going to say. Don't overthink it. For me as a stutter, overthinking, that's why the ad living is so good. I know my content. I know my stories. I know it. I don't script a lot anymore. I do bullet points so I can go where I want to. And when I figured out how I could edit my own conversations in my own head and have it come out my mouth, it made me much more relaxed in any setting. Wonderful. I am thinking just as a listener 
of your story right now that you must have tremendous empathy for all speakers as a result. Yes. Oh, yeah. I have worked with great speakers, people that are frustrated, people that stutter. But the biggest thing is I have all this stuff here, Rich, and I don't know how to get it out of me in a way that will capture the people. They want to listen to me. They want to engage with me. So I've learned so much about all that myself. And the radio helped me a lot. I I did radio for over 25 years behind a glass window, and people rarely saw saw me unless I was doing play-by-play at a game. So my voice and my brand literally was just the voice and the brand. There wasn't this. Then I got on camera and the whole thing went a whole another direction now. So then my brain goes to where did your nervousness then go? Were you then just completely confident once you figured that equation out or did your anxiety sometimes crop up? It rarely ever did after that. You, you So... I, I also have a strong faith, uh, a, a strong spiritual faith. And my faith plays heavily into this because I would pray. I would ask, take care of my tongue. There's a crowd out there. They paid to come see me. And as I finally began to understand that flow, that balance, literally, God literally said, you're free. And the phrase that has gone through my mind for years is simply speak. And let him take care of the, t- the tongue tiedness but my job is to go out and speak and do what I do. And the more freedom I allowed myself in that, the greater my confidence rose. Because it really wasn't me, it was God working through me. And I also had the ability to say, I'm okay. To the point now, if I do stutter, I make it part of the act. I will literally stop, instead of having someone get uncomfortable, because the audience would grab their chair, they think it was gonna be a train wreck now, what did they come for? So I would literally go, <laughs> Take two, everybody. You ready now? And they'd all laugh. And the pressure disappeared. So I find my sense of humor helped me get comfortable with just going with the flow. I love this so much. And this was an unexpected <laughs> part of the story. I love it. And I think I don't want our listeners to miss by accident, because I, I do think you've been clear, the the belief part, right? The belief yes in yourself is such a core piece of your delivery about the end result is the belief that you have in yourself starting. Oh yeah. No, that you, you, you have to be able to believe in yourself. So I coach people that when you go out live on stage, you give someone else your introduction, like you did for me, which was so well, let someone else introduce you, brag on you a little bit. You don't need to brag on yourself. And then by having that introduction, you are set up for success they already bought their tickets. They're already in the room. Someone else is already amplifying you. I just need to go out and do my thing. And they already believe in me because you've already told them I'm good. You've already said I've got these accolades and these awards and whatnot. I don't have to prove anything after that point. I just need to go out with full confidence and say, boom, hi, I'm here. And hit them with excitement. Hit them with passion to start my conversation. Great. So the need to prove something and as an experience of experiencing pressure can be really dangerous when someone's about to be on stage. Yes. Yes. And that's what would tangle my tongue. The more I felt the pressure that I got to go off there and I've got to wow these people, they don't know who I am. They don't care. So the more that internal pressure came up, it was more like, I'm going to kill myself when I say hi. And for a stutterer, the hardest thing to say is our name. So if, if no one introduced me, I'd go out and say, hi, I'm, um, and I would blow it. But by having an introduction set you up for success. Uh, the other trick I learned for me personally was um, I play my own music before I go on stage. So I, 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 I love Carry On Winwood Sun by Kansas. I'll crank it to 12. I'll do the air guitar. I'll sing in the background quietly so it doesn't disturb everyone else. But I literally get amped up for the show. So when they introduce me now, I'm already powered up. I'm already ready to go. The curtain go up, the lights go up, and I go bang, and I hit it with that excitement, and I'm free after that. I'm completely free from that fear of what am I going to do? The first things out of your mouth are so important. It took all that fear away. Of, now I'm just having fun. Because I was playing air guitar 30 seconds ago. <laughs> <laughs> Good song choice, too. Um, I, I will share what happened just before we pressed record. I have a standard habit of taking three deep breaths so I can just separate 
myself from whatever happened before the recording to get present. And I could feel Rich's energy was already on. Like he was all set to go. He didn't need to do the three breaths. And I love it. That and and each guest is different that way. We we each have a different relationship with that internal machine of of speech production. It's different for each of us. And we all have our histories with coming to terms with it, right? <laughs> well, again, since I came out of radio, it really was, except if I was doing a game out in public, um, it, it was the voice. When I got more on the TV side then, because I have loved some of the greatest entertainers, I, I, I love Johnny Carson, his ability to just have a casual conversation and make it entertaining and fun. I gravitated to that. I, I was studying and watching. So when I got on camera, I had a sense of, I already know how to be dramatic. I'd done acting. I'd done some other things. And that was another layer that came in. So now, and this is another great tip, I fall in love with the camera. That, that, that camera is my girlfriend, uh, a big crowd of people. There's no one in my home studio right now. But I believe there's a crowd across the glass. So my imagination from my childhood, and by the way, I did used to talk to my action figures. We, I would line them up. And I would talk to them like they were a crowd. So I had Batman and Superman and G.I. Joe all in the same audience. And I would talk to them. So today, with this virtual audience, I still believe they're right in front of me. And I just go present full on, like you said, because I believe it's important to present like people really are watching and listening. And it's part of the illusion that as we perform now on camera and stage, you need to learn that skill as well. Wonderful. How do you teach your clients? What are some of the core things that you don't want people to miss? So one of the biggest thing was during pandemic, as everyone sat down, everyone got their cameras and microphones. And uh, a lot of the professional speakers that I know I've worked with would call me and say, you make this look so much fun and it's easy. And they hate it. They, they hated not having the live crowd and the, the noise and the everything that goes with that live arena. And so I literally, number one, would say, stand up. And they would laugh at me. And they're like, Rich, this is stupid. You and I are both alone in our home studios. Uh, some, some of them were in their bedroom. You can see their bed. And they're like, this is stupid. And I'm like, just stand up and keep talking to me. So they would adjust their camera and get talking. Every one of those interviews, every one of those discussions, midway through, someone stopped and said, Rich, why did this change? And I would play dumb. I'm like, Why? What do you mean, Christine? What just changed for you? And they said, well, I'm standing up. And right there, they stopped. I'm standing up. I'm not sitting down anymore. And I said, yeah, your mind is telling you you're performing. Your mind has said you're back on stage. That simple thing of standing. I just did a keynote an hour and a half ago, live virtually. I stand for every keynote because my body knows what the stage looks like and feels like. If I sit down, I'm in a passive mode. If I want to go all in, stand up, and you will instantly go back to live stage. That's the number one thing I teach everybody. Okay. Now I'm curious. You might teach people the skills, but do you notice that some people are still resisting being fully present and fully kind of a performance in performance mode? Yeah, there's a difference between performing and performance. And you need to be on. You need to be that whatever your brand is, you need to be that brand entity here. But you need to be that voice of authority. You need to be that confident voice. So um, I coach a lot of people that are just now getting into this that don't want to use monitors or telescriptors. Take a post-it note and put your points in front of your screen off camera, literally right in front. So that I'm talking to you right now. My camera is up high. I look at the camera, not even directly at you on the other screen, and then I put post it notes, one, two, three, four, and I put my speaking parts right there. So you can hit every one of those very strongly, but it still looks you and I are having a private conversation. It takes the distractions away. It keeps all the focus right here, and that's where you want everyone in your conversation. You want it to be you and I, and it just so happens your audience gets to listen in. Okay. Then that issue of authority in terms of maybe the individual's ambivalence about showing up as the authority, maybe they know all the things, 
they've written all the books or they've <sighs> done all the thinking that's required, but then they get on stage and all of a sudden that sense of their authority kind of dribbles away. What do you say to that person? So again, that's where know your story. More and more, uh, we're a TikTok generation, we're a soundbite generation. So I coach people on their main phrases are the best sound bites are ever going to have. So I, I talk about rocking the virtual stage. I talk about rocking the stage. I talk about helping people shine on camera and shine on stage. The same stuff rewrapped around, and I can use them different ways. If they can learn those and have those phrases ready to go into your interview, into your conversation, you immediately own that because you know it inside and out. But you have to make it sound like it's a natural sound bite. It's not like something you forced into a conversation. Politicians are great at this. If you want to learn how to do sound bites, they ask the president a question. He does not want to answer that question, but he has to say something. He'll preface it, do this, but he will lead it back to a sound bite he had planned that day. And there is gold in owning that instead of being off guard. So really, that's where knowing your material, but it's got to be short and quick so people stay interested. Okay. So preparation is a big tool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You have to know your material inside and out. And if you are an author, I work with a lot of authors. I do book launch parties. They want to read the book. They, they literally want to open it up and say, let me read you this about my book. I take the book away and I say, tell me about the book. Tell me about the characters. Tell me your genius of what made you write it versus read me the book. They want to read you the perfect paragraph. Nobody cares. <laughs> they want to hear what they did and why they did it. And that's a different comfort zone for a lot of authors. So there's a lot of coaching of know your material, be confident in your material. Your book is still your book, but you are now the narrator. You are now the expert of the book. And it's a big step for a lot of people. So when you were that young child struggling with the stutter, did you know about the power of your voice back then? That's what I keep thinking of as we're talking. So I'm going to ask that question here. No, uh, that's a huge coaching area. And it started my broadcasting career. I brought it into all my coaching I do as I teach media skills to people. The voice in your head is your head cavity sound. What you hear in your own, when it comes out right now, I'm hearing head cavity. You have to get used to listening and watching yourself and listening to the room sound. It's different than your head sound. And the first time I listened to audio tapes, it was like chalkboard. It was like, please, Rich, don't ever do that again. And I literally had to learn how to use my voice to raise the pitch, lower the pitch, to storytell, to be whisper when a whisper is important, to raise it when you get really loud and excited. And as I did it, I found that different pitch in different place that became more of the brand media voice. It's funny, 36 years later, people will call me and they'll say, hey, dude, it's me. You're using your radio voice. And I didn't realize I'm doing it because I'm doing this so much now again. But there is the head and there's the room. You need to study your voice, get comfortable with your voice if you're really serious about making an impact. Okay. All right. Love it. And thank you for sharing your responses there. Could you talk about the anxiety that people associate with performance? And you have such joy with with the the art of speaking and performance and coaching. Uh, most people, I would say, have some amount of fear, real stress, real physical reactivity when they're oh. thinking about even going on stage, let alone being on stage. Can you share some stories or some guidance for people who might be listening and are in that category? Yeah, there is an innate fear. The number one fear in all the world is public speaking. It has been that way for years. Since COVID, we've added a camera now into everyone's life. <laughs> so that intensity has gone up. They're like, how many different webinars have you been on where people have turned their camera off, but they'll talk on micro? Because that camera is the next fear level. They don't want to show up. So, yes, I help people relax. I have them find a comfort zone. Um, I coach about your environment. Normally, I have a green screen. I've created an environment that's a media-centric persona that people see, and they go, oh, this guy talks about media. This guy's a broadcaster. 
it sells me before I even talk. Creating your environment. If you don't have a green screen, that environment that you can create promotes you, advocates for you, speaks for you. And that's another way to get over the anxiety because I know people that love comic books and their shelves would be filled with action figures, comic books, and they're going to talk about being a comic book geek. Well, they're in their environment. There's nothing to fear here. A lot of people are trying to step out without being comfortable in their own environment. Now, when they turn on the microphone, it raises it. So the more you're comfortable in your bubble, the better you're going to be naturally. Okay. Great tip. Great tip. Um, can you share a story of a transformation of how maybe somebody was near blacking out with the thought of saying something in public to really just shining and being really comfortable uh, and natural on stage? So I, I work with executives and companies on this stage presentation on learning media skills. There was an insurance company that hired me for their top executive team. And they were struggling during pandemic, especially, but the idea of talking, communicating, doing sales calls, uh, comforting clients that were in tough situation. They used to do that live in person across the coffee table. They would go on the road and go meet with people. Well, now it's in a Zoom box by themselves. All these things we've talked about. And one particular gentleman in this company never turned on his camera uh, because he was in a basement and he admitted, I was in a hoodie with my dog eating my Cheetos and I'm not going to turn it on my camera. So every client felt the confidence drop further and further because they weren't doing this anymore. When we did my coaching, we went through an hour-long session, that particular one, broke them all in the mini breakout groups. They came back, and the first guy on camera was this gentleman that I'd been told about in advance, turned on his camera and said, you crushed me. You killed me. I am now ordering the virtual backdrop from the company. I'm putting on a collared shirt to show I'm professional again. And he went down a whole list of things. And he said, I'm going to learn how to talk to the camera like I'm talking to my client. And I'm going to do everything you described because it is a game changer for the business. And he admitted I was the weakest link to the corporation's failure right now. And the rest of the team applauded. They actually said, thank you. Well, job well done. <laughs> And when you see that and when they can own that and they can feel they can really step into it, that's why I coach and do what I do. I love it. That's a wonderful story. It shows the change in one person can change so many people, so much energy, so many businesses. Yeah. Absolutely. Communication, our presentation, our comfort level with showing up is so critical. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being a wonderful representative of that message and teacher of that skill. Can you please share with us how our listeners can stay in touch with you, can watch your TV show, all the things? Let us know. Yeah, the easiest way is to go to rockthestagemedia.com. That's rockthestagemedia.com. Uh, that highlights many of the different services, offers, and you can see replays of the Rock the Stage show. Uh, Rock the Stage Show now streams live every Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, and we're on multiple streaming platforms at once. That's one thing we haven't talked about. I'm the biggest advocate of live TV like it was back in our history, uh, and I love getting on multiple channels, doing one show, but many people can see it at one time. I'm coaching and leading people now on how to build their media empire. Uh, so if you want to learn more about that, visit Rock the Stage Media or uh, Rich at richbontrager.net is my email. I take all my own personal email. Contact me. I'd love to talk to you. Okay. And I will share that information in the show notes. Thank you so much, Rich. You've been a delightful guest. So many stories, so many nuggets of wisdom and such a great success story that you've shared with us today of your own life. So thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, everyone. That was a an episode knocked out of the park. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you next week when the next episode drops. Take care.